challenges the quantum world. Some features are still discussed and debated. You will hear more about the Schrödinger cat in the parallel universe, one of the versions. It's related to the Schrödinger cat. And of course, that during the Big Bang, when this Big Bang happened, of course, that quantum mechanics should have played an enormous role. And I'll comment about this. So we will start right now with some elements. We will arrive probably to the parallel universes, and we will continue with the parallel universes in the afternoon. And you see a uh, title which is below that, that we are stardust, because this is a uh, this is the reality. We, the nucleus, the nuclei, and the atoms which we are formed are shaped in star, inside the stars, since the nuclear reactions are bringing the atoms into being. So I will try to give you an overview and the flavor about these fantastic features related to the image we have today about the burst and the evolution of our universe. And uh, this is a very nice sentence of one of the, uh, well, biggest scientists today. He is a theoretician, but he writes wonderful science book as well, Michio Kaku, who was saying that, of course, that <laughs> for him, it's really a strange world not being a scientist, going through life not knowing or maybe not even caring about where the air came from, where the stars at night come from, or how far they are from us. He says, I want to know. And of course, that if you are here, I give for granted that you want to know. And let's see, related to our universe, related to how the stars are, how far they are, and how they evolve, and how they are producing the stardust, which we are, are coming from. Here you see our Earth and the Moon. We start just from our neighborhood. You know that the distance to the moon is about one second light. So the moon is not so far, at least not in astronomical units. It's uh, our satellite. It's still some work undergoing with the origin of the moon. It's believed that the origin of the moon was uh, coming from the collision of an object which is more or less a, was more or less as big at March with the Earth. So what remained over it's it's what we see today as the moon. We have our star, we know more or less characteristic of the sun, we know its temperature, the surface one it's about 5000 degrees, while the inner temperature it's enormous, it's about 10 millions of degrees. And that's the reason for which the energy of the particles inside the sun core is so high that they can undergo nuclear reactions. And I'll comment about this because this is the nuclear fusion reaction, which opposite to the fission, which we can control in our nuclear power plants, the nuclear fusion, it's still a dream, might bring us some uh, clean energy power in the future. Now the European effort, it's undergoing uh, under the ITER project in France, which is an international collaboration. We want somehow to reproduce the conditions in the sun, of course not heating so much because we can't, but going with the powerful magnetic field which can confine and give energy to the nuclei to fuse. We have our own solar system and uh, we more or less know it. It's not only the planets which are there, but there are some objects, asteroids, comets, which are coming. And probably you have heard about the planet Nine, which was claimed to have been indirectly discovered recently, namely a planet which stays far away from the sun, 600, far, 600 times farther than our own Earth. It should be at least 10 times larger, rotating around the sun. It in as, as large as more than 10,000 years. It's not yet clear that planet should be discovered with our telescope sooner or later. It was discovered by the fluctuation which are induced on the Kuiper uh, objects uh, in the far periphery of our own solar system. So, um, we more or less have some knowledge, even if it's not complete, and the fact that it might be a new planet in the solar system, the so-called Planet Nine, tells us that 
there are things to do even in our real neighborhood because this might open the window towards the existence of a tenth planet. Why not? Even farther away, even uh, more difficult to discover. So what is a solar system and how it evolves? Have you been there? So how far we have arrived? There are two, well, two few things to say here. So the first man who flew in the space, it's Yuri Gagarin who was the first, uh, well, um, uh, Russian uh, man who was uh, succeeding to make a fly in the universe. So he was uh, exploring. He was the first pioneer who flew into the space. But then there were many other adventures, specifically the Apollo missions. You have heard that two days ago was dying one of the, the Apollo 14, uh, I forgot, Mitchell, I guess, was his name, uh, at 82. He was one of those, not very many, who stepped on the moon and uh, have left there. Not only this was, as they were saying, a small step for themselves, but a huge step for humanity. Here are these first steps that you can remember. But uh, for those uh, unfortunately still present people who doubt that somebody was on the moon, which is completely crazy, there are some leftovers which uh, prove that we have been there, namely window, not windows, uh, mirrors. So there are a series of mirrors which were installed on the moon. There are arrays of mirrors which are still used today because this is a kind of lunar ranging system. We shoot laser from the Earth which comes back because it's reflected on these mirrors, so we can have a closer monitoring of the distance to the moon. So we could so check that the moon is going away from us, not at a very high speed, some centimeters per year, but if you add the centimeters in ages, you will discover that the moon will fade away sooner or later. So we can use something which was put on the moon by these astronauts by many years ago, and we can check how this evolves and which is the distance to the moon with an incredibly high precision. And um, the next target might be Mars. So Mars is still uh, something which we have sent there many rovers, you know that Curiosity it's there and has explored a lot of interesting uh, things, has been traveling a bit around, but for the moment, no uh, man, no woman has landed on Mars. This is a very difficult problem, not only from the technical point of view, because we do have the technique to arrive on the moon, even if it's not 100% safe, but not even taking a flight might be 100% safe. What the problem is, there are two kinds of problems. One is related to the health, to the physical health, because there is cosmic rays. So the cosmic rays are very dangerous because they might produce uh, mutations, genetic ones, which can induce cancer, direct cancer to the person, or they might induce genetic mutations, so the, the sons of that person might have problems. So one problem is to protect ourselves against the cosmic radiation. The other one is, of course, mental problems because going away in a travel which might last years and being alone out there might not be so easy. Uh, how many of you have seen this uh, movie, Survivor? Many, quite many of you. You have seen part of the problems, of course, this was a movie and the hero, of course, as in the movies, the hero can know everything and he succeeded to deal with. But that was rather a realistic movie in the sense that these are real problems which we have to deal with when one will hopefully go one day to the moon. So this is our next target, which uh, might be achieved sooner or later. There were some missions planned by NASA time ago. Now they were kind of um, postponed. It was some rumor a few years ago, if you have heard about that competition organized by SpaceX, which has put forward a public inscription, so enrollment procedure, who wants to go on Mars? So thousands of people enrolled to, I want to go, because it was only one way trip, by the way. So you get there, but you can't come back because they didn't have the possibility to bring people back. So the idea was you, we bring there some people who will uh, establish a first, let's say, 
uh, establishment with persons, then one day we might send some others and some others. So of course, this would be a very difficult problem, not, being, uh, not even dreaming or hoping to come back home. So that was space six for the moment. It's in standby, and I think it's fair to be in standby because if we cannot ensure uh, anything safe for that person, uh, it might not be a good idea. While NASA, China as well, India, Japan do have some plans to try to send people there in the next one or at most two decades. Uh, our apparatus so arrived farther away. This is uh, an image of, uh, well, an artistic view of Rosetta and File. Uh, File just said goodbye to us uh, yesterday, more or less. Uh, it becomes clear that we will not be able to reconnect with it any longer. You know the adventure, so Rosetta has started this meeting. It started tens of years ago in order to fly towards this um, a comet, Churium of Gerasimengo 67P, which in fact it's it's a very small one. I chose Madrid uh, as a city to to show the relative uh, dimensions. So it's a kind of a rock, four kilometers length. So it's really very very small. So arriving to get on it, uh, it's absolutely not uh, granted. So it was absolutely a success. The fact that Rosetta brought there this lander, which is called File, with a lot of apparatus on board, but the success was not complete because you know that once File touched the ground of the comet, it did not succeed to anchor very safely, so it bounced it twice. Hopefully, it didn't fall away from the comet. It could have happened, because bouncing twice, since the comet is very short, it could have fell away, but it didn't happen. However, it was not so fortunate, because uh, it, it entered into a shadow, so into the shadow, the problem is that there is no sun and the energy source was supposed to be solar energy. And since it didn't get enough energy, it had power only to get measurements for the two days from the leftover battery. Then it came to be into being again by August when the comet came closer to the sun and it succeeded to report some data. And I have a colleague of mine, an electronic engineer, who is working at the European Space Agency in Toulouse. And he was telling me that uh, they succeeded to get this data by August. But it was a big problem, because this data lost the timestamp. So they transmitted, but it was not clear what was the time order of the data. So they are still uh, fighting with understanding. Uh, it's not clear whether the data were not sent randomly. So it's, you see, this makes us again wonder what is time, but that's another story. So Fila had had on board many apparata, uh, more or less 12 if I'm not wrong, each one able to perform a different type of measurement. Part of these measurements were related to the analysis, chemical analysis of the ground and of the soil and of everything uh, there around. And um, we succeeded so to learn a very interesting and important thing. What exactly? The fact that there are organic molecules on the comet. By itself, this is not quite such an exciting news because organic molecule does not mean life. It means only that there are molecules containing carbon, kind of complex, rather complex or simpler molecules containing carbons. And it, they did not succeed to analyze the uh, exact structure of these molecules. So we know that the organic molecules are present in the universe, which makes us wonder about life in the universe in different forms. So this is what we know. It's, it was a success after all, because we succeeded, however, to target and to reach the comet and to send our own uh, materials there. This is a kind of a more recent image. It's New Horizon, it's the Pluto uh, planet, or well, not planet, it's not a planet anymore, it's a mini planet, it's too small to be considered a planet, but for the first time ever, we succeeded to have clear pictures and a real view of this, uh, this uh, well, mini planet. So it's very interesting because uh, 
it was hard to expect that the geography of this uh, object is so interesting and so uh, diverse as it proved to be. So you see now they started to give names and to understand which is the origin of these structures which uh, are on the soil of this planet. We didn't succeed to do this yet, so this is a movie, it's the interstellar movie, which I guess who has seen it? Okay, so quite few of you. So it's a movie which uh, uses wormholes to, well, to bring humanity in a different place in the universe, or at least to try to do so when humanity has reached a no return point from the fact that we succeeded to more or less destroy ourselves by the stupid and crazy things we humans are doing. So this is yet not a thing which we have succeeded to do, but, uh, well, we are hoping to, to arrive there. This you have seen today, you will see it over and over probably, because this is the putting together all the information we have about our universe. At least all the information we have using the electromagnetic radiation. This today, it's more and more necessary to be underlined because since the discovery of the gravitational waves, we might have an image of the universe which is not only in electromagnetic domain, but might be achieved using gravitational waves. Viviana will uh, talk more about this Friday morning. So having this in mind that this is not a complete view of our universe, but it's an image of whatever emits electromagnetic radiation, and we know for sure that not everything emits electromagnetic radiation, not the black holes for sure, at least not directly, not the dark matter, otherwise it wouldn't be called dark. So we have here uh, an image of our known universe. Where we are in this image? In the center, of course. So we are in the center. What does it mean? That we are in the center of the universe. Back, back to the center, finally. Well, if one does not really want to believe that we are in the center of the universe, it only means that we can see at left as we can see at right, up and down. We have the same capacity to see in all directions. So it only means that more or less uni the universe is isotropic and more or less homogeneous, more or less because otherwise there wouldn't be structures. So it only sees, it would be much more fancy to imagine that we are here, no? This means that if we look around here, we see a lot of things. If we look in the other side, we see absolutely nothing. So this means, and I will comment on this when we speak about the parallel universes, this probably means that the universe is much, much bigger than this. So I'll come back to this. So in this image, we are at the center of the universe, but one needs to add, we are in the center of the observed universe, which by itself does not mean too much claim about the real dimensions of the overall universe, assuming we might speculate about this. We don't have, we, we not only have an image about our universe as it is today, but we have also a theory about how it came into being. A theory which it's not only, let's say, some imagination, flying of imagination, but it has some coverage. It's covered by some features, by facts, and I will tell about facts uh, soon. So we have an image about the universe which says that the universe was born more or less 14 billion years ago out of this explosion, let's quotation marks explosion because it's not a real explosion, about an event which is the Big Bang event which we don't know what triggered it, it's still something which it's far from being uh, known. We know that the universe was born since 1929 when Hubble discovered the universe expansion. Before 1929, people believed that the universe is static. Static means that it always existed and it will always exist. Yes, more or less a star is born, some star is dying, but basically, in mean value, universe is equal to itself, it's static. Einstein himself believed that in his equation of the general relativity to make the universe static, he introduced a term, the so-called cosmological constant, just to make the universe static. 
When Hubble discovered the universe expansion, Einstein said, oh my God, this was the biggest mistake of my life. Now we reevaluate his biggest mistake because that term he introduced might explain the dark energy. And uh, again, uh, this I will comment about that. So the universe probably started uh, to evolve this 14 billion years ago with a period which is called inflation. I'll, I'll discuss this. Uh, so uh, an expansion, a very rapid expansion of the universe, then the expansion became more smooth. At some point in the past, the expansion started to get accelerated, so it's not only expanding, but it's expanding in an accelerated way. Initially, only particles, a very hot universe composed of particles, was present. Then the universe started to get colder and colder because the expansion triggered somehow the cooling while expanding the universe was cooling. Structures, first particles started to aggregate, then atoms started to come into being, then atoms started to aggregate in dust, the dust in uh, stars, and then the galaxies. Uh, this is another image of the same event where the inflation is a bit less uh, underlined because we don't have uh, proofs of the inflation. We have proofs about the, um, let's say, evolution afterwards. So this is a different way of saying the same thing. Initially, hot universe, you see, 10 to 32 degrees. Uh, then became cooler and cooler. Now the mean temperature is around 2.7 degrees. This is the temperature of the background radiation, cosmic micro background radiation. Now let's see step by step each one of these events. So after the Big Bang, we know nothing about the Big Bang, what could have triggered it, what could have been before. Legitimate questions, but we don't have answers. We believe, however, that in the very beginning of the universe, a period which is called inflation should have occurred. What is this inflation? It's a period when the expansion of the universe was extremely, extremely important. So the speed of expansion was far, far higher than the speed of light. One might say, oh my God, but this is not contradicting Einstein. It, it does not. Because the Einstein theory only says that the speed of whatever object signal inside the space is limited by the velocity of light. Einstein theory does not prohibit that the space itself moves with speeds bigger than light. Since we believe that the Big Bang triggered the formation of space and time, so it's not that the universe exploded in a pre-existent space with a pre-existent time. Time and space were born together with the Big Bang. And if this is the case, the space itself was created during the Big Bang. So why we need such an accelerated expansion in the beginning for a simple reason which we can see here. If we look at the universe around us, what we know from it, and if we look here and the opposite direction, they are distant something like this is 13 billion years far from us, this is another 13 billion years. This point and this point are far away, 26 billion light years. Now the problem is that this point and this point during the expansion were not in contact. They cannot be, at least if we believe that it was not inflation. So if we believe that the universe expanded with a velocity smaller than the light one, this point and this point in the beginning of the Big Bang could have been as far as 13 billion light years far away without inflation. It's clear, this concept. So opposite points were in the Big Bang moment, far away, 13 billion years among them. Then the problem is, how could it be that the universe is so uniform? Why it's so uniform? If these points were not in contact in the beginning, they could not share the same information. So the theoreticians then invented this inflation theory, which includes a moment when the expansion was with a velocity far, far higher than the one of light. 
So in the first, first moments, the universe expanded exponentially, which said so that this point was in contact with this. And all these faraway points could be in contact because initially the velocity of expansion was far, far higher of the space, I repeat, far higher than the one of light. This is called inflation. And uh, what triggered the inflation? It's still an item under debate. We believe it's a kind of a field, field which we imagine similar to the Higgs field. It's not, it cannot be Higgs field for some reasons, but might be some energy field which we still didn't discover if it's still some remnant there, which could have triggered these very, very first moments, you see limited to 10 to minus 35 seconds. After this, things become much easier. So after this presumed inflation, which we might discover one day, I remind you that one, two years ago, there was very big excitement about the gravitational wave, which proved to be faked, not faked, false, at least the claim that was triggered by gravitational wave, because BCHEP2, an experiment at South Pole, claimed to have, uh, to have seen imprintings of uh, inflationary gravitational wave on the cosmic microwave background. This was not true because they proved that in the end it was a signal but that was due to the dust in our own galaxy. Then uh, particles were born, so quarks and anti-quarks and whatever particles were born in the beginning, but these particles and antiparticles, we believe that they were born in equal quantity, should have suffered annihilation. So many matter, antimatter annihilated, and what remained, it's only a leftover from this annihilation. This is a big problem of modern physics, the asymmetry between the laws of matter and the laws of antimatter. It's still a big question of uh, which we are trying to find an answer. We have a partial answer going under the CP violation, which we have proved. So these are some symmetries which are violated between particles and antiparticles. And this is something very, very interesting, but still an open problem because the asymmetry we measure in our own laboratory is not enough to explain why matter still survived as much as it did. Afterwards, quarks, uh, got trapped, they become prisoner into protons and neutrons. They are not free anymore. So this is the hadronization period where protons and neutrons start to come into being. Then afterwards, well, it's the same period when we believe that the four fundamental interactions uh, are splitted out of a unified force which we still don't know whether it exists, but we believe that it might exist and we might be able to uncover in uh, experiments uh, in the future. So afterwards, uh, nuclei started to occur. So we are one minute, less than two minutes, first nuclei are formed, which are the simplest form of nuclei, hydrogen, deuterium, and some helium. So not more than that. Not more than that, because while these simpler nuclei were born, universe was still expanding. By expanding, energy of the particles became smaller and smaller. So the universe were becoming cooler and cooler. So at some point, the nuclei, the nucleus, uh, protons and neutrons, did not have enough energy to go to heavier, heavier nuclei. So that's what, what happened. We only arrived with this nucleus, this nuclei, simpler and uh, light ones. The others are born in the stars. At some point, so before that, that nuclei like uh, hydrogen and helium, of course there were many electrons around as well. And of course that every now and then electrons were trapped in atoms around this nuclei. The problem was that since the photons were there, the photons kicked the electron and it ionized these uh, atoms. This up to some point, up to some point where again universe is cooling, 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 photons are having less and less, less energy because expansion of the un energy of the universe triggered a kind of a enlargement of, way of their wave function Higher wave function means less energy. So the photons did not have 
energy enough to ionize the atoms anymore. This is the very moment when matter starts to dominate. It's 300,000 years after the Big Bang when the radiation decouples from the matter. So the matter goes in own way, while the radiation becomes what it's known today, we still have it today, is the microwave background radiation, which cooled, 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 now it has 2.7 Kelvin. So this is the moment when matter started to dominate and, well, you know that this discovery of the uh, cosmic microwave background radiation, which is an excellent proof of serendipity, this very, very nice word. When you look for something, you hit into something else, and that something else might be even more important than what you were looking for initially. So these two gentlemen, Penzias and Wilson, discovered this uh, microwave background radiation while they were trying to do communication at Bell's laboratories. Nothing to do with Bell from John Bell. And um, this is an image of the cosmic wave background radiation measured by Kobe. And uh, you see that uh, it's, not, it's rather uniform, but there are fluctuations at the level of uh, uh, 10 to minus 5. So we are so precise in measuring now this temperature of this radiation that we know that there are fluctuations at 10 to minus 5 level. Is this important? It's fundamental because we believe that these random fluctuations on the cosmic microwave background represents fluctuation coming back from the 3,000 years after the Big Bang generated originally by quantum fluctuations. And we believe that the structures in today's universe, galaxies, bigger groups of galaxies, are at origin generated by quantum fluctuations in the moment of the Big Bang. So we have even today an imprinting of the quantum small fluctuations at the origin of the universe, which on one side trigger temperature fluctuation on the cosmic microwave background radiation, on the other side, this is in the radiation universe. In the matter-dominated universe, we have the structures. We have the wonderful structures. And the wonderful structure starts with our surrounding. So we have here our neighborhood in terms of stars, starting with Proxima Centauri, four, year, four light years nearby. Going farther away, we start to see at some point our galaxy. 100,000 years in diameter. We are 30,000 light years from the center, luckily enough because in the center there is a black hole four million times heavier than the sun. And then if we go on and on, we see big groups of uh, galaxies clustering. Here are super clusters and super, super clusters of many, many galaxies up to the image I have shown to you before. So since now we should have a break, I stop with this presentation here and we will get back uh, in the afternoon with the parallel universes. Thank you very much.